day, we are wrapping up the discussion. May his name be praised forever. His name be praised forever. And oh, what a journey. Um, to open up with our prayer, let me, I'm going to have my, my elder would do the closing prayer because he said the last time he was here, he did the opening prayer and I've been thinking about him. But Russell, can you please come up and give us an opening prayer? And after that, the next voice you would hear is our facilitators. Thank you. Let's kneel for prayer. Our Father, we're so grateful we can pause a moment to ask for your presence here. And not just here, but the world over, wherever your people are gathered this Sabbath day. we especially grateful for the program here, Lord, in the seriousness attached to the testimonies that was published for us. For the generation then, Lord, it was light beyond their kin. But for us, we're looking backward and forward while we're in the present at this point in time. So help us, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to draw close, to make the right impressions upon us, and that the truth, Lord, that we need for this time May it leave an indelible mark on our hearts and our minds. And we pray, Lord, that thorough reformation would be ongoing in each heart, each family, the world over, so that the work for your church and the work for this earth can come to its close. And Jesus can wrap up the story of redemption so that none of us may miss out on so great a salvation. We ask these things unworthily and undeservedly but in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Testing, testing. All right. Sounds very audible. Wonderful. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so Good afternoon to everyone. I hope everyone is well. Um, it's a it's a it's a beautiful and it's a warm Sabbath afternoon. Um, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember whether during the week it was hot or cold. I know Thursday was quite hot because I was stuck in traffic due to the current crisis that we've got in Cape Town. Um, something for us to to reflect on. Um, you know, as we were. Uh, gridlocked, trying, uh, I stay in Somerset West, as we were gridlocked, trying to get out of the city, you know, we were, I felt stuck like a sardine. I couldn't go to the left, I couldn't go to the right. There I was in a single file, just caught in between cars. Uh, and I think the reality that in the last days, you know, if we're not prepared, the opportunity to get away will be, yeah, it will be few and far between. It will be chaotic. And this and this just from, from you know, almost like a such a quick decision. I mean, there was no word that this thing was going to happen. Um, I was sitting, having a meeting somewhere, and one of the guys came in and he said, listen, I don't know which way you're headed, but I just want to let you know that they've decided to strike and I've told my staff to go. And if you stay out that side, I suggest that you get moving. And initially, I was, honestly, I was tempted to take it lightly. I was tempted to think, no, man, it's not that bad. I'll go back to the office. 
I'll sit there till five and then I'll wait it out and then I'll leave. But something just said, no, 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 get onto the road. You can finish up on the other side. Lo and behold, I ended up, as early as I left, I ended up being stuck in traffic for like two hours. Two hours, what, what is normally a 30 minute drive. Anyway, uh, let's pray and then let's begin our discussion. Shall we close our eyes? Dear Jesus, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, I just want to thank you for the gift of life. Um, we are living in trying times, Lord. We are seeing signs of the world coming to a close, the closing scenes. Um, many um, began the week with us as we close this week. Um, last day today, the Sabbath. Uh, some are no longer counted among the living. Yet here we are, we have the privilege to still be discussing your truth. Uh, perhaps, Lord, there's something that you've prepared for us. Perhaps there is a need for us to make a decision for you this afternoon. So we thank you for this opportunity. Also thank you for the opportunity to serve you um, because we know that faith without works is dead. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, having journeyed here, from various places, um, that our that our faith might be strengthened, and that by putting it to action, uh, we might exercise that muscle of trusting in you. Be with us now. Uh, may your spirit be present as we discuss your word. It's not my word, Lord, but yours. Um, so we pray that your children shall be edified. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So. As we wrap up volume one of Testimonies to the Church, uh, I think it's, it's, an, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's, for me personally, it's been a long time since I've been part of an exercise um, at a church level of reading a book from the Spirit of Prophecy from cover to cover. Uh, I can't I can't remember the last time it must have been I think when COVID started I think we did um, yes yes so really uh, an honor to be to be in a church that is seeking to hear what God has to say to us in these last days so today we are covering chapters one o four to one one nine I know you covered chapter 104 a bit last time as well. Um, but I I think there's some points that weren't touched on. So I'll touch on those and then we'll, we'll proceed. Um, all right. Just a few disclaimers. Um, so my duty today is to facilitate. Right? I'm, not, I'm not going to try and teach anything, but I'd rather like to guide a discussion. Um, I really enjoyed as I replayed um, the the online stream of last the last discussion, how it was an interactive discussion with the members. Um, and it wasn't, you know, a speaker up front interpreting his view. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think I was really touched uh, and impressed that. Um, I really want to open it up and to have us discuss and engage with these concepts. I think one thing that I've realized uh, from being a young Christian in the church to being a little older now is that sometimes when you hear, or at least for me, my personal experiences, when you hear someone, you know, relaying like a like a quote from 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 the spirit of prophecy, especially. And I, I used to get this sense of, ah, you know, this, this person just wants to bulldoze the discussion now because no one can say anything after someone takes out a quote from Spirit of Prophecy. So I really want us to own the discussion. I don't want it to be, you know, he's whipped up the quote, and so now we must all agree with it. Uh, I hope we agree, but I want us to be convicted and not just agree because Ach, sister white and we're just all meant to agree with her because it doesn't help us as individuals when we do that we really have to 
And I pray that the Holy Spirit will impress the truth upon our hearts so that, you know, we're able to resonate with what's being said and we're able to, to own it because uh, that is the only way we'll be able to act on it. Uh, and I think the last thing I want to say is that, you know, whenever we hear truth, we must act on it. Whenever we hear truth, we must respond. And there can be various responses to truth. The one response may be to forgive someone. Uh, the one response may be to make an apology to someone. Another response may be to make a change in your life. Another response may be to make a decision for God. There's always an opportunity to, to grow closer in your walk with Christ. And so whenever we hear truth, let's commit to always making a decision. All right, so we start off by reading Acts chapter 14, uh, verse 22. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. So I want to confirm, we've got two hours. We end half past five. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> Very glad to see you. All right. So Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Um, yes. Does anyone have the mic? Testing one, two. Okay. Read for us. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Okay. Now let me just open this quickly. I'm sorry. Chapter 15, 14. 14, 1, 4, verse 22. Okay. 22, the Bible says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceived... Is this the one? No. I'm sorry. 14. Oh, that's 17. I was reading sorry, earlier. I'm sorry. 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 Chapter 14, verse 22. My apologies once again. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Where they strengthen the believers, they encourage them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And so chapter 104 is titled Conflicts and Victory. And we at the, at the in the opening scenes, um, we'll go slowly through the first two chapters. Then after that, we'll start to go a lot quicker because uh, we've got a limited amount of time. Um, so we see them returning from the south of America and they're heading back to, to, to Battle Creek um, where they reside. And then they eventually reach home, Battle Creek, and they find that their previous efforts had not achieved all they hoped. Reports and jealousy still existed. And a friend of the Whites, whom Sister White had known for 22 years, related to her how they are perceived to be extravagant. So this is the Whites. They are perceived by the church at Battle Creek to be extravagant. Uh, and this friend ex mentions the purchase of an expensive chair. She then explains that, you know, James's health was taking a knock from the traveling and a normal chair tires him out. And he would often rather lie down in bed or in the lounge. And Sister White felt this was no way for him to obtain strength and that he should rather sit up, hence the purchase of the chair. And eventually, unable to restrain her grief, Sister White weeps for some hours. Now, I want to believe that the thing that brings her to tears is that despite their suffering, the devil was seeking to do injury to their ministry with a lie. And she says this, she says, Satan sometimes so influences minds as to destroy all feelings of mercy or compassion. The iron seems to enter the heart and both the human and the divine disappear. Now, before we start our discussion, I think 
if the truth is told, we as Christians can sometimes be very harsh to one another. We can be very critical to the point of forgetting that the other person or the person on the receiving end also has feelings. And we don't stop to think what our actions are going to do to another soul. And so here we see an example of just that. Um, are there any comments on? Yes, yes, my dear. Anyway, it's on. I don't know if they can yeah. hear me. Whatever. Look, there's something we we need to. I want to invigorate our minds real quick. In what position, what geographical position was Ellen White when she was selected to be the Lord's messenger, prophetess, or you know, for this time that we're in? Mm -hmm. um, Maine was a it's on the east coast of the United States, yes. and it's quite significant because if you really study the depth of what she was given and the, the, the suffering she had to endure. If we look at Revelation 7, the angel that comes from the east with a light to seal God's people, it's quite significant that the message originated in the geographical position of the, the two on beast, which is Revelation 13, the United States, but specifically that she was there on the east coast in Maine. It's just off, you know, New York State. So that in itself speaks volumes as to why, you know, the bitterness that God's servants have to endure. Remember, Christ came unto his own and his own received him not. And if you're really going to stand firm for truth, you're going to suffer the same bitterness. So that's just something for us to think about. Go through these testimonies. As we reflect back as on where the advent movement began, it was given a particular, it was given a particular geographical position. Geographical not, in position. Europe, not, not in Europe, in Africa, nowhere on this earth. It had to be the east coast of the two-owned beast, which is the United States. And Maine in particular was the place where our faith was founded and developed. So it's just something for us to bear in mind as we go along. Amen. Thank you for that thought. Thank you for that thought, definitely. Um, something to ponder upon. It's interesting how, you know, God and how he does things, how, you know, even in terms of how the prophets and Moses, when they write about Christ, and when Christ finally comes to earth the first time, there's... God is constantly giving his people an advanced warning. He's constantly speaking to them through his word, giving them an opportunity to understand something that the rest of the world may not catch. Amen. Um, and and it's, it's to this effect where Paul says, you know, that um, we should not be caught off guard or caught unawares as those who are of the darkness, because we are of the light. Um, so it's it's interesting. We should we should really stay alert. All right, moving along. Um, and so, any any other comments? Any other comment on this on the dynamic of how sometimes, even though we are all Christians, we can sometimes, you know, be harsh to one another or lose our way um, in 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 how we interact with one another and not reflect the character of Christ. Any other comments? All right. So, <laughs> Sister Shiri, can someone pass her mic? <laughs> yeah, that is something I often am so shocked about at how harsh we can be with one another. Because, you know, the, when we pray, we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Mm -hmm. And if we expect God to be merciful and kind to us, 
how can we not be merciful and kind to his children? Mm -hmm. This morning in the lesson, we were talking about we are all the father's children, you know, and how can we treat the father's children like that? And so, like, I mean, they were all in the same church, part of the same family. What could have brought these feelings about? And oh, I, I was feeling so sad when I was reading mm. what they went through, how they gave, they put everything on the line, and yet they received opposition from those who were supposed to support them and encourage them. No wonder she cried for hours. I wanted to cry with her as well. <laughs> One, two. And, and it just shows also how we can be so judgmental. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what was going on in their lives. Like when I read about how, you know, <laughs> James White sold everything that he possibly could because he didn't want to be a burden to anybody else. And when he finally got to the point where he couldn't anymore and he had to ask for money, he was refused. I couldn't believe yeah, that. Very sad. Yeah. Very sad. From the brethren. From the brethren. From within. From within. <laughs> From within. No, it, 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 it's... Okay. Uh, continue? Yes, I think uh, one of the great texts that we should bear in mind is that these things were written for our admonition. Mm -hmm. So God allowed them to go through this so that we can learn. When you are engaged in the work of God, you must expect these things to happen unto you. You must. There's no other way. It will happen sooner or later. So this is an opportunity that we've been given to fortify ourselves with encouragement from the word of God, the spirit of prophecy, and from those whom the Lord will choose to encourage us. But we will face this and worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, encouraging my brother <laughs> brother will you, and I, yes. I also just wanted to add how you know when she needed that encouragement God didn't give it to her himself he actually used somebody else to give them a dream to share with her mm -hmm. so it just shows us also that we need to make sure that we are in tune with God and that we listen and we hear and we obey to pass on the message that we are given. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just before we get to that point, actually, the other point I wanted us to touch on is, you know, later on, Sister White, um, you know, she, she gets this report that a sister had stated in Memphis and... I don't know how to pronounce this word, Lapier, that the Battle Creek Church had not the slightest confidence, confidence in Sister White's testimony. The question was asked if this referred to the written testimony. The answer was no, not her published visions, but the testimonies born in meeting to the church because her life contradicts them. So in other words, her testimonies about a simple life, about modesty, what was being said is that her life of extravagance <laughs> contradicts all of those testimonies she had written. And of course, the devil was merely trying to do, to do injury. And he was really doing his best to discourage them and, and take them out of the ministry. And an interesting thing happens, you know, um, upon requesting that they would show her wherein her life had not been in accordance with the teachings. She says, if my life had been so inconsistent, inconsistent as to warrant the statement that the church at Battle Creek had not the slightest confidence in my testimony, it could not be difficult, it could not be a difficult matter to present the proofs of my unchristian course. They could not produce anything to justify the statements made, and they confessed that they were all wrong in the reports circulated and that their suspicions and jealousies were unfounded. She later goes on to say, I freely forgave those who had injured us and told them that all I would ask on their part was to counteract the influence they had exerted against us and I would be satisfied. They promised to do this, but have not done it. So after failing to prove um, the, the fact, after failing to back up their lies, 
um, about the whites, or rather the rumors, let's call them the gossip and the rumors, let's not call them lies, gossip and the rumors that were going around. When confronted, the people who were spreading these things could not, they could not verify, it was, it was unfounded. She then simply says to them, right, please assist us then in counteracting the injury that you've done to us. And these people were like, yes, yes, no, no, we'll, we'll do that. And later on, you know, they are found to, to be pretty much unrepentant. Um, and, and I think the question then comes that I'd like us to, to, to dwell on. The interesting thing is she says, I freely forgave those who had injured us. Um, and, and so the question I have and I want us to reflect on is, do we even easily forgive those who injure us? Or, do, or does our forgiveness come with conditions? In other words, I'll forgive that brother if he apologizes, or I will forgive this person if they make recompense in this way or that way. So we discuss, does our forgiveness come with conditions? All right, two hands, I see Brother Ernest. Thank you. For the online, for the online guys. Oh, okay. Um, when you say, or rather, if I'm to say, um, I won't forgive Brother because uh, until he comes to me, mm -hmm. what's my benefit if I do not forgive? Do I have a benefit? I mean, that's how I look at it because I, I don't see any benefit in not forgiving. So I'd rather say, geez, this was a mishap, but for my own sanity, whether he says he's sorry or he's not sorry, he could say he's sorry when he doesn't even mean it. I don't even know. So I just said, well, geez, bygones be bygones. And, um, it's a forgiven. He doesn't need to come to me again. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. Because at times, I'll probably say sorry, and I don't even mean it, right? So what's to stop him to say that? So I think the, the for your own sanity, for my own sanity, I just say, geez, what's well, a mishap? Look, I'm not happy about this, but what can I do about it? Nothing. Well, I've forgiven him, and then I just move on. Amen. Brother Bradley? Yes. Okay. Um, so so there's uh, a, an interesting sermon that I listened to um, by, by Randy Skitt. It's called Giving and Win. And he describes how he asks a couple of people um, whether they would forgive their spouses for cheating. And generally the ladies said, in a way we could, but the men, um, only one man said he would. Um, and there was a bit of a talk about why that is the case. Then he goes into the Bible and he says, we call ourselves, I'm paraphrasing um, everything, but he says, we call ourselves Christians, meaning Christ is our example. Yeah. Then he says, when Adam and Eve wronged God, God came looking for them. Mm. Now, when Adam and Eve were busy finding excuses as to why what's happening is happening, God tried to lead them to actually confess their wrong so that they could deal with the problem. While at least they were still stuck in hiding behind the scene, God provided a solution for reconciliation. And he says, as Christians, that is exactly how we ought to try and look at it. Now, it's very difficult because I myself, I, I think I was in the number that wants you to come and ask for forgiveness or to, I need you to apologize. I needed you. Let's put it in the past. Mm -hmm. I was in that number as well. But it was a huge challenge to say, am I in a position to be wronged? And then understand that I'm wronged, forgive so that I can move on. Maybe pray for the person who has offended me. Now, if I say I'm a Christian, I need to learn that. Mm. Amen. How was that? Uh, there's a comment on Zoom from Brother Cladwin, and it says, 
Some differences need us to actively engage for them to be solved. We often are tempted not to face matters, but discuss them behind each other's backs. And then he also put a quote from the actual book itself. Uh, it's from page 594. I again requested an interview with a few select experienced brethren and sisters, including the persons who had circulated these things. I there requested that they would now show me where in my life had not been in accordance with my teachings. Amen. So, so that an example of an engagement where people sit down and they try iron out what the issue is. And I think often, of course, there is the tendency to sort of want to run away. I think the truth is uh, disagreements are not only uncomfortable, but I think they are also embarrassing. Sometimes we reflect on how we behaved and we would rather not confront those, those feelings and we would rather not go back to that place. I know for me personally, um, that's a big struggle, especially in the context of, of marriage, right? You, you act poorly and it's difficult to apologize, even though you know that you should. And... Rather than apologize, you know, you start doing nice things, you start buying flowers, you're avoiding the uncomfortable conversation. You're avoiding to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I should not have acted that way. And and <laughs> you start doing nice things. And 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 in fact, that and I think this is what we see from our from our relationship with Christ, in fact, that forgiveness costs nothing except for one to confess their wrongs right that that that's all that that, that Christ asks of us James 1 verse 9 right oh John sorry John yes first John first John 1 verse 9 um you know okay brother Antonio I think you had a hand uh, Yes, we were talking about forgiveness uh, and the fact that it's, it's not conditional, right? It was mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us as we forgive. Is that conditional or not? Forgive us as we forgive. Mm -hmm. Because I understand as Christians, we, we have no choice. You have to forgive. Yeah. No matter how hard, you have to forgive. That's Christianity. Mm -hmm. But let me give you a practical example. If I rape somebody in the church, God forbid. are you supposed to forgive me? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being practical. Yeah. If I rape someone in the church, yeah. are you supposed to forgive me as a church member and as a church body? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Good question. Am I supposed to face justice or not? Yes. yes. That's my point. Amen. Amen. Thank because you. Because some people try to excuse justice because of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. No. Even in the case of Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. there was justice. What yeah. was the justice? They were so ashamed, now they had to die to self. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the justice. Amen. Amen. Brother Emmanuel? Okay. Um, for me, I think sometimes the problem is on the person that does the wrong thing other than the person that we wronged. Like like in the sense that sometimes, like in my case, um, there's um, like a while ago, there's a person that I, I sold one of my motorbikes and then uh, that was not in good condition. And at that moment, I knew that this motorbike is not functioning well. Mm. Um, so after a couple of months, um, it's how my relationship with God was now getting like closer, you know. And then I remember when I was praying, it's just that that incident popped up in my mind, you know. And it was really pressing in my heart that I had to go back to that person, even if it was a couple of months later, Yeah, you see. So, and I, I even struggled to find this number because it was some months after. So 
but I still, I thank God that I found his, his number. It was still in my phone book. And then I called this brother. I said, explained everything that, I, that happened and I apologized. I was willing to even, you know, pay for anything. So to my surprise, he said, I had already forgiven you. Mm. You see? And this, this happened like a couple of times to me that I had to go back to apologize. And all these people, they were saying, I had already forgiven you. And so I'm saying most of the time it's, 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 to, it's us, not that other person. Those people, the other people, they're like the people that we wrong, sometimes they forgive us like before. While it, we still have it. The guilt. The guilt. <laughs> and they're already done with that. Like, ah, no longer thinking about it. It's like, you see, what God did is that God said in John 3, 17, I send my son not to condemn the world, but that, that yes. the world might be saved through him. Yes. Mm -hmm. So as he was sending his son, he was not saying, you did this, you did this, you did this. No, no, no. I'm not coming to condemn the world. Though you sinned against my my, my laws, though, you, though you, you went against my laws, but I'm not coming to condemn. But we find ourselves sometimes when people wrong against us, we go and say, we always repeat it. You know, after a month, I, do you remember? That's the guy who stole my, you know, things like that. <laughs> Even if we say, we, we sat down and we discussed about it. It's done, you know. We still remember that mm -hmm. when we when when that somebody passes by. Oh, that's that's the guy. You remember that? You remember I was looking for my. That's the guy. You see. <laughs> so I think we should have that Christ-like mind, mm -hmm. where even though people wrong us, but the the Lord's prayer said, "Forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us." Mm -hmm. You see. People sin against us. We sin against God, but still God forgave us and accept us. And Sister Mindy has a hand. Or is another hand that side? Okay. Two hands and then we'll... Um, I think as a Christian, it's really the, the topic of forgiveness is a tough one. I think we hold each other to very high standards. And so if a child of God hurts me, it's especially painful because you knew what not to do mm -hmm. and yet you did it anyway. Mm -hmm. So now I must deal with the disappointment. Mm -hmm. I must deal with the actual pain that I'm going through. And then I must deal with the expectation everyone else has for me to forgive. Mm -hmm. and that one doesn't just come easy so my question is always okay I must forgive period but is there a time limit is it my must forgiveness be now immediate or is there I must acknowledge pain I must heal I must but then there's also other people who linger in those spaces of oh I'm taking my time to get over it or when do I get over it and then forgiveness also comes with the reconciliation do we reconcile do we go back to how things were if we don't does it mean i didn't forgive so there's a lot i think it's forgiveness has got many faces and i, I can't i struggle with always picking just the one what is it what is the what is true forgiveness and does it have a deadline wow that that is my <laughs> job <laughs> yes yes look we're in serious trouble here with forgiveness. There is a lot of sin that's unforgivable, eh? Mm. Mm -hmm. We single it down to the unpardonable, but the unpardonable sin entails truth. Mm -hmm. And how much aspects to truth is there? And if, if our church manual says to us, we can get divorced for irreconcilable differences. What does that say about what we're discussing here about forgiveness? So now we're sanctioning divorce because we can't forgive one another, in other words. Mm -hmm. yeah. And who sanctioned that? God? His word? So forgiveness is going to keep us here for an eternity. Um, this is the thing. God's spirit works on the heart. And forgiveness is two things. It's between two people. It's not one-sided. Because everything we're discussing here is that one person must just say, I forgive you. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. You rape somebody, that means there's two parties involved and there's other parties attached to those two individuals. 
and God's spirit has to work on both sides. And that small, still voice has to urge you, but you're dealing with satanic power that builds resistance against that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if both parties resist, there's no forgiveness. And a simple church setup or a simple board meeting or, I don't know, post that mustn't go a certain way or the way the money is handled, mm -hmm. that is sufficient examples to show us that there's both the urging of God's spirit to forgive the person, mm -hmm. but there's resistance both against it. And until either party gives in, the one that gives in first is the one that will be more prone to forgiveness. We're just trying to sum it up, but this thing has kept us here. It's like we're asking Satan to repent at this point in time. Can he? Sure. Can he? The spirit of God can do nothing to reconcile him back into heaven. You know, so there, there's a limit. There's a limit to God's forbearance. Yeah. Yeah. There's a limit to grace. And there's a limit to forgiveness. You can study it here in uh, Matthew 12. Okay. Matthew 12 from verse 30 onwards yeah. gives us the entire breakdown of sin that is unforgivable. And it's not a singular sin. You know, it entails truth. If you grieve, if you go, if you build resistance against truth, not even the blood of Jesus can forgive you. Yeah. It's unforgivable to resist or reject truth. So if we're saying we're the people of the book and we have the truth for this time, you know, and we build resistance and reject that, how can we expect forgiveness from one another or from God? That's just something to think about. We can't answer these questions. Yes, can I? Yeah. I'll come to you, Sister Porsche. I think the brother had a hand first. Is it Brother Mike? Yeah. Or... Go for it. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I'm struggling here. Uh, the the example is the same the one that they say someone raped someone and the church can forgive that person and the church says yes how can he, the church forgive someone when they are not the one who experienced the pain someone who experienced the pain is an individual person mm -hmm. so how can this connect he now if I do that wrong thing, the one who I, I uh the church can call the person and take me to the to be judged, right? And I'm given 20 years in jail for that rape. Now you are you are here in the church, you say we you forgive me, but I'm serving 20 years in in, in, in Posmo there. Mm -hmm. How does that forgiving get, get into my, my my situation? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so so I think like like sister um sister Sharon was just re-emphasizing the fact that you're forgiving doesn't remove the consequences, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's where justice comes in. Okay, in the day you eat of it, you surely die. Do we die? Yes, we death came in as a consequence of sin, right? But we they were we were we they were forgiven, but the, the justice still the consequences of having done wrong so you have been forgiven but it doesn't remove the guilt i would just okay there is a comment online that our technical team has signal please go ahead with the comment may i just encourage online participants please if you can speak through so that we we still know that our 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 zooms that thing we were that uh, element we were testing still works so don't just post but speak out then it's even quicker thank you um so there's there's comments from two people uh the first one is from brother cladwin um and it says forgiveness does not automatically translate into reconciliation one can forgive but it is an additional step to then seek to be reconciled with the individual who has wronged him god's ultimate goal is for us to be reconciled with him and the same model he wants us to use with fellow humanity and then the second comment is from Sister Mary, and it says, if we expect God to forgive us now, we too must forgive now. It's hard, but a must. Forgiveness is a gift from God. We must ask of him. It does not come by chance. Cool. Okay, I'll go to Sister Portia, then I'll come here, and then then I'll, you know, then we'll move to the next point. So much to still cover. <laughs> Okay, um, I just wanted to read this because this has 
literally a testimony in my life when it comes to forgiveness yeah. um and and each time when i'm feeling like i'm keeping things um bottled in me i always come to this verse because this verse taught me about forgiveness and taught me that god loves forgiveness yeah. right it's in psalm 130 verse 3 which says if you lord kept a record of sins lord who could stand but with you, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, save you. So if you think of all the things that you do, all the little sins that you do, all the big ones that you do, and you go to this verse and it says, the Lord does not keep a record of sin as long as we also, like, I mean, put it in ourselves to, to ask for forgiveness. The Lord blot out everything. Because in him, there is forgiveness. Um, my short testimony is that I kept something because someone had wronged me. And in this, I want to say forgiveness starts within you as an individual, regardless that the other person has forgiven you. First of all, you, you must be willing to forgive. You must be praying towards forgiveness. And in this testimony of mine, I we were having the 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 quarterly when we were learning about forgiveness. I had spent almost about two or so months not coming to church because I was holding something against someone, not here at church, but within the Adventist community. So I was like, if this Adventist, maybe from Zim, for example, did this to me, then how would I go to that Adventist church? So it was hurtful, like what Lindy had said, because it's the brethren that I walk with and that I spent counsel with in the house of the Lord. So it was too hard. And then the one morning I prayed to God and I said, God, I want to forgive, but please, I want a sign from you that you're advocating for this. Mm -hmm. And in this sign, I told God to say, I haven't spoken to this person for this number of months, but can you let this person make the first step by sending me a message. A message should have these words. Um, that was me asking for a sign from God, not that I wanted the person to be saying that, but I wanted a sign from God, right? And then I read this verse that Kotele was talking about this verse. I prayed again in the morning. My phone was off on the charger. And the very first message that I saw on my phone when I turned my phone instantly was the answer from God. And from that very day onwards, I realized that as long as you keep it to yourself, there's no forgiveness even from the Lord. Let it out and let God, because if you speak to God, having a willing heart, the Lord will make it happen no matter how the person has wronged you. So the first thing is start it within you. Forgive and ask God to help you. The Lord will come through for you. Amen. My brother? Amen. Yeah, no, just quickly, um, coming back to Michael's point about the repercussions for rape. Now, the difficulty we're struggling with, we designated as God's people, but we do not have our own territory and our own system of governance. Okay, so if you rape here, yeah, there's consequences for the civil legislation in the jurisdiction in which we live. However, the forgiveness part can be between the two individuals, but there's gonna be people attached to it because they will tell the person closest to them, you know? And then you're gonna have to bring two or three. So the Matthew 18 process is basically a general approach to forgiveness. If it can't be solved between two people, you bring a third person. That third person should be a believer that understands the faith, huh? not a novice. And what we have today is, is quick conversions, bring people quickly into the church. And then we have incidents like that that we can't solve it. We run through police, we run through a jurisdiction, uh, a representative, which is the courts, and, 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 and the story gets out into the public domain and God's name is blasphemed. Now, if we were to follow what the word says, you won't even get to rape. If you rape, we kill you. Mm -hmm. That's what should happen. 
you should die instantaneously. Do you know that if you read Numbers and Deuteronomy and the Old Testament, you disobedient to your parents, we stone you to death. You break the Sabbath, you get stoned to death. We sit here and we break the Sabbath. You know, we sit here, we break the Sabbath and we do not die. Why not? Why aren't we not dead for violating this word? All of us, professed as the A's. God is long suffering in the new dispensation and we use that as a license to rape, kill, steal and do whatever we like and get away with it. Because today we've got a government that is thuggerized, gangsterized, banksterized, and they get away with it. So what do they expect from the citizens? You know, and that's why we have civil war in so many territories. Look what's going on in Sudan and Mali. Look, look what's going on in Ukraine. And do we know what's coming? <laughs> so the world doesn't have an example because we don't understand our faith. The, the requirements of God is that high that if they had an example to look to, we would be the leaders in this earth. That's the whole point of being an Israelite. It's not to be following those outside of the faith to teach us God's way. They're supposed to be looking to where are these people that are God's people. Let's be like them. You know, we're supposed to be the leaders in all things. Fortunately, we may get there, but we're only going to get there once the Lord has brought judgment into our ranks. Amen. Just a quick one on that. To your point, see the way Mrs. White had handled the conflict. It was it was such a beautiful process. And I like the fact that she engaged the people concerned. You see, when we do that, you are not going to, you're not going to be gossiping behind people's back and building this thing. Mm -hmm. If we have a community, you see, that's why she could say, I freely forgive them. And what caught my attention is the fact that the reason why she was expecting confession is because, and that they should, they should actually um, remedy the negative influence is because of the cause <laughs> of God. It is because she needed, she, she knows I am receiving these messages from the Lord and they need to have the effect. And because the, she can see that it's the devil that is bringing all these um, troubles, the reason why she was insisting on go and remedy the influence is to save the cause of God. So if we can keep that big picture, you know, I'm beginning to Ephesians. I never thought that I, I will enjoy the book of Ephesians like I'm doing right now. You know, chapter three, that part where it, it is, Paul is highlighting the big picture of the church, why the Lord created the church. We are a miracle, like to your point, to the world, an example, and not just to the world, but to principalities and powers in heavenly places that it is possible that I am so different from you and I have my defects, but the Lord, because we have, we have that vertical going, the horizontal is going. And that doesn't mean the absence of conflict. There are conflicts, but see the example we have in the way it was handled. Amen. All right. Can we go to Brother Emmanuel? Then I'll come to you, okay. Brother Antonio. And then... Okay. What I wanted to say is right. that... Um, I think when it comes to forgiveness, it's 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 a it's something that we should like think outside the box. It's a, we should see at a bigger picture, and we should also have regards to God. Like who is God to you as individual? <laughs> because and also we should relate to what God has done to us. And I believe that as parents, we should set examples for our children, because um. I can give you a, 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 um, an example that happened um, in back in Zimbabwe. When I was in Zimbabwe, when I was, I was very young, I was told after it happened. It, it happened that um, every Saturday uh, in our community, they knew that we won't be at home. We'll be at church. And um, there was no one who was going to look after our animals like goats and all that. So we, we were just leaving them in the fence. Like goats, we could just tie them with a rope, with a very long rope. So they just graze around. So it happened that one of the Saturdays, we went to church. And then when we came back, we couldn't find one of our goats. And one of our relatives passed by our neighbor's house. 
and it's 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 he arrived at our house said you know what your neighbor is slaughtering your goat now so you have to go and confront him he said you know it was like now you should you go now if you go now he hasn't finished he just started now <laughs> you see if you go now you know you're gonna find it <laughs> and my dad said let them eat just leave it you know and my mom was like no what do you mean <laughs> let them eat like my kids are eating with vegetables and you saying it's fine what do you mean it's fine my god is is gone so i think as parents we should set the example i regardless, regardless of how much it hit my dad the lessons that i got from there is something that the world cannot steal from me mm. you see instead of confronting my neighbor in fight that's that probably maybe that's what i could have learned like if someone wrongs you you revenge you fight mm -hmm. you know because that's what i saw my daddy doing but the fact that my daddy did not re react in that way he said let them eat you know so that lessons i think as parents we should seek, set examples not to be just do like people who, who talk you know we should practice what we are saying mm -hmm. okay. Okay. i've timed myself <laughs> for 20 seconds okay uh, I've learned a lot so far, honestly. That's why I love these meetings, especially the point that that young lady mentioned earlier. Mm. One of the dangers is for us to dismiss this process of forgiveness. You can say, oh, brother, forgive your kids. No, that's very dangerous because mm. people have different timing to heal. So we shouldn't say that. But above all, my comment is this. In this process of forgiveness, you must understand human nature. Just because you forgive, you forgave him, doesn't mean he needs to become your friend again. You mm -hmm. need to understand human nature. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, brother Ernest, and then I'm going to move to the next point. Okay, okay, sure, sure. <laughs> oh, okay, now I'm, um, I'm asking if someone can help. Maybe we want to put a balance between um, the forgiveness and the element of of pride because it seems as if we insist so much on he has to come and ask for forgiveness for me that's for me to forgive him if he doesn't do that i'm not going to forgive him right now when he comes i will get a bit of satisfaction because now he's submitting he says no please i'm sorry I, I i don't know what came so that element now we've got a lot of pride that we don't need in us now we put high conditions he has to come he has to come and at times the issue is not even that much of an issue but for me to actually say i've forgiven he must come and i'll put all these conditions to to downgrade and degrade him so much for him to come so i don't know how we can deal with that as christians as people because pride is what's holding even progress in the church because elder so and so he hasn't, he hasn't apologized i'm not going to do anything for the church so mm. i think we need to look into that Amen. thank you My brother uh there's a saying that goes uh like this joke joke for instance how many times do we hurt people through jokes and we don't even say forgiveness you know mm. it's just a joke why what's going with that person i mean it's just a joke <laughs> so we're hurting so much people in the church through jokes and the person they just leave the church we as elders have to run after those people and bring them back and it's uh i'm not coming to the church for instance like if a person is fat how many times you make comments on the on the person who's fat mm. and not even thinking that you're hurting that person that person will be struggling to get down a fat you know She's been going through so many fat attacks and stuff like that. And we laugh about it. And we don't we don't care. We don't care what we say to one another. It's a joke. What's wrong with that person? I can take a joke. Hmm. So everyone is not the same. You know, people are sensitive. So we have to be, be very careful. I, 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 I spoke to some lady one time and I said, 
we must live in forgiveness. In other words, if Brother Antonio and I, I are very close, so I know Brother Antonio very well, so I won't say things that will hurt him. For instance, I know if I say that, he might laugh, but not really laugh. Mm -hmm. It will hurt him. But now I keep on saying it, and then it causes that because he, I'm an elderly person, he won't say anything to me because he respect me. Mm -hmm. But I don't see what he saw. I just keep on doing what I'm doing. So living in forgiveness means it is also to 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 to, to make sure that I prevent uh, causing that I have to go in for out of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So that is what I just bring to the table. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move to the next point and then we're going to move to, to the next chapter. And then from now on, I think I'll just touch on the key themes per chapter. We're not going to go into too much detail. But the one point I felt was important for us to discuss, like the subject of forgiveness, is the subject of extravagance, which is touched on in, in, in chapter 104. Um, and Sister White is quite cut at the suggestion that she's extravagant. And I, and I had the question, you know, what about today's Adventist church, right? How do we perceive extravagance? Like if someone said to me, ah, brother, who are you looking quite extravagant today? I would probably say thank you. And I would walk on, truth be told. I wouldn't, you know, like, ah, you noticed. You know, but I felt quite a strong rebuke as I read this chapter on the subject of, of extravagance. I think Sister Eleanor touched on it last Sabbath, or the last time the discussion was held, talking about how you often find these rich people who don't who don't have an outward show of how much they have. Yet, truth be told, uh, we now struggle with, you know, the most expensive clothes we can afford, the most expensive cars we can we can afford, the best private schools for our kids, um, the biggest houses, and all of these things. Now, I'm not saying they are wrong. I'm just saying, let's reflect on it. Uh, I'm not bringing any opinion. I just noticed that Sister White was qu quite upset at this idea that as, a, as, a, as an honest Christian, that they were being perceived to be extravagant and chasing after money. Um, she found it quite offensive. And in fact, I imagine that those who were spreading those rumors, the reason it was something to gossip about is because in that time, it wasn't something that was good. I mean, it's not gossip. If I get an A in university, and everyone keeps saying, did you hear? Did you hear? We all got an A, we all got an A. That's not gossip. Right, because it's a good thing. It's you know I'll be proud of that that going around, but this was a, this was something that they found um, to be quite hurtful. All right, any thoughts on that? And then we're going to move to the next. Any thoughts on how, as a church and as individuals today, how we relate to extravagance and how perhaps the testimonies are calling us to relate to material things. Look, individual circumstances are not exactly the same for two households. Mm. If you get an A at university, you're not going to be working for a rand, are you? <laughs> Isn't it? Mm. So you're, you're, I mean, look at this. Are we going to say Christ was extravagant? No, because he didn't have much on this earth, right? Mm. But he's a king, and he owns all of it, by the way. Mm. Is he extravagant now? Where he's seated on his throne? Hmm? That's the question. The golden throne the and and how heart. about Queen Elizabeth? She's passed now. Buckingham Palace, is that extravagance? Let's hear. Yes. Now, <laughs> now, how extravagant is Christ on his throne, by the way? Mm. So where are you going to draw the line, you know? At the end of the day, we, if you study the context of 
the message and the purpose we are to serve on this earth. You know, the, the, the world we live in, people look at your, your, your address. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at him. <laughs> look where he lives. You know, and then the story starts. Whose business is that? Ooh. You know, the fact that we see it here should shut us up. And that's it. You know, we see it here. We, we have like-minded, we believers in the faith. And how we go about our daily business shouldn't be anybody's business. You know, we should just be happy that God has got a variety of individuals to represent his cause. You know, coming back to a point, Sister White was defending the cause, mm -hmm. not herself. And that's what we must. You know, we, we get hurt because, you know, if somebody hurts you, that's self getting hurt. Yes. You know, and you got a war against that. Mm -hmm. We talk about World War One and World War Three is about to break out. But the biggest war that was ever waged is the war against yourself. If each of us wage a war against ourselves, we're going to look like a bunch of mad men and women when we leave this gate. And I'm serious. You'll have police chasing you around and asking you what's wrong with you, you know? And that's what you're going to experience. So the extravagance thing is going to keep us here forever. Solomon was extravagant, was he? Did God sanction it? You know, he built the most magnificent structure. Mm -hmm. Those pyramids that were built by those Israelite slaves that's there in Egypt. You know, people that study architecture, they baffled and mesmerized when they get there. They've never seen so much weight carved out so precisely with no ground support. You know, it's, it's slabs that fit in together like this and it runs for kilometers. They, they cannot even today, by today's standard, they can't put up a structure like that. You know, with all the technology that's available. So mm. are we going to call that extravagance? You know, yet it exceeds. And that's the point. God wants to baffle those that are outside of his belief system to such a degree that they will poke it and call it extravagance and lunacy or extremity, you know. But as long as we know we're in harmony with God's word, mm. you should just let people's words and accusations and insinuations be water off your back. You know, get duck feathers and see how much water lasts on, you know, <laughs> throw it on your back. <laughs> that's, that's how you deflect it. And then, I think there's a, there's a hand. Yes, go for it. Um, hello, uh, everyone. Okay, so I, I just wanted to, to agree with what you said, that there is a thin line, you know, uh, when you talk of extravagance. And I think it's it's personal, according to the knowledge that we've received um, in Christ, to know whether you are living over or beyond. And um, yeah, context, right? Mm. The context, um, context, and purpose, because sorry, I don't have the mind. Yes, <laughs> you can go ahead, brother. You go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say that. Um, I think the the comparisons are nice. You have Solomon versus someone else, because there we read that and we go, "Wow, God blessed him," and I can imagine how he lived. Probably amazing. <laughs> we also have the example of Abraham. It's very clear he was one of the wealthiest people during that time, but we don't view him as being ostentatious or or, you know, throwing money in everyone's face. Yeah. But yet someone can have the same wealth and yes. then be viewed very differently by God. So I think it's it's context um, and character. Yes. You can you can be poor but have the best character, but you can also be poor and be a horrible person. Correct. Um, when we view people, I think, and, and we look at them and say, you know, what they have is probably not good, and we make a judgment call. I have a theory that a lot of it is just based in our own insecurity. Mm -hmm. So we, we look at someone else, what they've achieved. We don't look at the context. We just look at the result. Yeah. And then we make, we almost reverse engineer and say, they probably cheated or lied or all these mm -hmm. things. Meanwhile, you just never studied hard enough in school, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you, your, your <laughs> life is different. And then um, the last point I want to make is that it's all subjective. You know, someone else's wealth is another person's poverty. Amen. Um, so Amen. The, uh, I remember wearing, you know, shoes that was like 3,000 rand a pair. 
and I met someone who was worth 300 million rand <laughs> and he was wearing a pair of shoes of 300 rand and yeah. driving an, uh, a car from the 90s, right? So for me, it was a rebuke because yeah, I am trying to hide my insecurities with what I'm yes. wearing. And he has acquired all the stuff. No one knows about it. Yes. You know, if you meet him, you'd never know. Um, but his character was 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 far above mine. I can I can say that other doubts. But I think a lot of what drives us to make judgment calls on other people is the is the fears and insecurities we hold ourselves, but we don't share with the world. So mm -hmm. how we pass it off is by hiding our faults by pointing at other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We've got a, a, a he's, he's, he's just he said what I wanted, summarize it very beautifully. Yeah. Just online comments. Who can go for it? Um, we have a comment from Happier. Um, it's a quote from Testimonies to Ministries, page 179. Um, the Lord condemns needless, extravagant expenditure of money to gratify pride and love of display. Amen. The purpose. Amen. All right. Moving along. Chapter... 106 talks about the concept of slashing, cutting and slashing, cutting and slashing, right? And the point is made here, uh, cutting and slashing is an expression used to represent the manners and words of persons who reprove those who are wrong or who are supposed to be wrong. Furthermore, it is properly applied to those who have no duty to reprove their brethren yet are ready to engage in this work in a rash and unsparing manner. But it is not to be used in describing those who have duty to reprove. And so the point I wanted us to reflect on is who or in what context do we have duty to reprove? It's going to sum up what we were discussing about forgiveness as well. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is in a position to carry out what God has written. That's why God has got order and rank. And there must be underlying harmony. Okay? The angels in heaven don't just get dispatched nilly-willy. There's order in heaven. And that's what Lucifer rebelled against. Mm. And that's why we're stuck here on this earth. Because to this day, you know, the spirit of rebellion is in all of us. We do not like restriction. We do not like correction. We do not want to be reproved, especially by our own brethren, sisters. Mm -hmm. So, yes, God's structure can be infiltrated and corrupted. You know, and Lucifer can sit there and lord himself there on the pulpit. You know, the abomination of desolation, we need to have a good study on those um, uh, chapters in the book of Daniel. When the abomination of desolation is set up, what that means is, when Lucifer marches into our church and he runs, he runs a muck from the top down, that is what it means. It means there must be, uh, we, we're supposed to rise up against it in the name of the Lord with the truth. So, yes, the procedure laid out for us to follow is exactly how the church, Ellen White was striving to set God's church up that way, and she did. She did set up the movement by writing these hundreds of thousands of pages of instruction for us. And because we've drifted and become more secularized, you know, that's that's the word we'll use. We've drifted away from God's standard. The reason why we're having this meeting is to pull us back. Yeah. That's the whole point of sitting here. That's the whole point of arming yourself with the testimonies and the truth. Because... We really need to study for ourselves, brethren and sisters. Okay. I can't emphasize that enough. Not me, but the Lord wants each individual to understand the truth for himself because we're too dependent on what the leader says, what the pastor says, because he went and studied it. I'll just go with what he says, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And that is where the danger is. That is where the enemy takes one man with his entire following. He doesn't waste energy on the followers. He just takes you, Mr. Leader, and he pulls you in a wrong direction, and off we go. And that's why so many are lost. You know, this, the Lord tells us this, you know, he says, this is the path, walk ye in it. And then he goes on to say, few there be that find it. Not many, few. So at the end of the day, 
let's pay attention to these strange unfoldings in our day. And when somebody comes with a message that is true, don't just rebel against it because there's, how can I say, there's a fly in the cup. Mm. You know, now you're being asked to drink it. And nobody's going to drink that, you know, but take the fly out and look at what's left in the cup. Mm -hmm. And maybe there we'll find the sweet savor of truth, you know, lurking to save us. Okay. Just okay. Yes, yes I, I wanted to comment on um how nicely this chapter, sorry to go ahead of you, and the next chapter flow in. So the, the concept of self-confidence then being what gives you the right to go and cut and slash others. Yeah. So yeah. feeling like you have a special place in God's on, as God, one of God's children, uh, for example, feeling like I can rebuke the way somebody else is singing because I have presented in the praise and worship team once upon a time. So a lot of times, um, we don't have the we don't have the wisdom to introspect in terms of why am I why do I feel in particular me have has God sent me to be the person to do this to this person or am I going off of my own wisdom of my own in in experience and my own intellect because then that causes us to do it the wrong way it causes us to 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 go to try to address issues with ill will and then hurt others in the in the, in the same instance mm -hmm. um and then additionally it was interesting to see, sorry to go back as well, the Phariseeism is also what causes a lot of these things. So feeling like because we have the truth and we've been sent to 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 share the gospel, now we are, we have, again, we have a special position um, in, in, in God's eyes. So we puff ourselves too much sometimes because we profess to be children of God. And then we, we use that to actually go and abuse and mm. harm others instead of using it as a tool to humble ourselves and actually see ourselves in the same people that we think we can be better than. Amen. Sister Eleanor, then. Yeah. I, I, you're going to forgive me. I just thought we couldn't, I couldn't, I don't want to pass by this response that the elders, the leaders of the Battle Creek Church. I, folks, I took so much comfort to see that a church is, is, can come together again. You know, this is the, it makes, it makes Ephesians come alive that there were conflicts and they realized they were so wrong and they did not just go in, you know, behind the backs and you know, just so that we can settle this thing and clear the dust. They wrote an open confession signed by the Lee elders of the church. I, and we have it on file. Ah, I thought, I'm proudly Adventist. The beauty of the gospel that I, you see, I don't think I'll ever get to a point I'm learning. I don't think I'll ever get to a point where I will really not love my brethren, even when you're, you're not, we are not on, you know, like I can be very angry with Shireen, but I'm, I'm not finding it in my heart to get to a place where I hate her. You know what I'm saying? Sister. This is, this is beautiful. Can you imagine that there was so much intention and the battle Creek, battle Creek was the heartbeat of the church. That's where they felt that disappointment folks we have on file. Uh, I, an open confession from the elders of the Battle Creek Church. This is the first time I'm seeing it in our church. Hmm. Sister, okay. look, the, that, there's blueprints in that 2,000 pages called Testaments for the Church, Volume 1 to Volume 9. We do not follow it because it's, it's queer and you're looking, you're weird and you are square and you're not worth it. For example, for example, and this is this is quite heavy. This ritual year every Sabbath is not written there. So there's a chapter entitled Behavior in the House of God in volume five. I think it's five nine seven or five nine one, somewhere there. Go and read how we must go and con conduct divine service, not divine service where our sanctuaries must be located. And then we're going to have to sell this and follow God's blueprint. We do not have time for that. That's 
that's gone. Right now, the encouragement remains. What we've read here in Testimonies Volume 1 should be enough to spark reformation here. Mm. Even if it just happens here, God's influence can extend anywhere on this earth at any rate of speed. Amen. So we cannot overemphasize the weight that that testimony is not written for Babylon or Egypt. It's written for you, professed Seventh-day Adventists, exclusively. It may have connotations and context to extend beyond uh, our, you know, our faith. But primarily, yeah, let's rather phrase it this way. It's primarily written for the professed, baptized Seventh-day Adventists. If you're not baptized, if you haven't been exposed to our, the peculiar features of our faith, do not get coerced and jump into the pond to be seen by men and women. You know, it's not an emotional thing here to mm. come here and, and, and accept this faith. You know, and, and, and unfortunately, the, the, the method of uh, extending the gospel and, and bringing people into the faith is a quick hurry scurry thing. And we look for numbers, we don't look for quality, you know, and, and, and sincere repentance. Because the Lord would rather have three or four of us here than have a whole church full of devils. Right? That's why we got the shaking. We read about the shaking, right? They now be the shaking. Now, lockdown and COVID-19 was a pivotal we example of emptying the church of all the devils. Tell a president to lock it. Nobody goes to church. Kerkes leeg, niks devils in die kerk nie. Klaas is toer. I'll just I'll just express it that way. Um, uh, I just I just want you to explain this. What is cutting and slashing? Because I think we rushed to be responding to this without explaining what is cutting and slashing. Because the way we have already taken it and answering it is like as if we like. If I go to my sister and I am sort of like counseling here with, I'm thinking what is wrong. I'm already cutting and slashing, right? So I think, I, okay, that's the impression that I'm getting when we are answering. So there is a need to explain the difference between cutting and slashing and the correct corrective. I will use for an example, um, um, what's my favorite auntie here? Auntie... Andy Valerie, right. Andy Valerie will be saying, the kids are making noise running up and down. Would you call that cutting and slashing? Oh, she's trying to prevent reverence in the house of the Lord. So there is a thin line between, and there is a need to explain when you now become an extremist and you're cutting and slashing, what is cutting and slashing out of the correct, corrective way of doing things? because mm. yeah okay okay because okay let me <laughs> it's brother russell yeah. russell okay okay funny enough he and i were looking at the same text as you were asking that question i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna read it and, I, and I'll, I'll try explain but unfortunately because of time unfortunately we can't dwell on it too long it says for the past 20 years those who have been reproved and their sympathizers have indulged an accusing spirit toward my husband which has worn upon him more than any other one of the cruel burdens he has unjustly borne. And when he fell beneath his burdens, many of those who had been reproved rejoiced. And from a mistaken idea of, of my view of his case, uh, December 25th, 1865, we were much comforted with the thought that the Lord at that time reproved him for cutting and slashing. This is all a mistake. I saw no such thing. All right. Unfortunately, there's another chapter which then explains what James had done for them to, you know. Um, but the, the 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 whole context of it is when there's a spirit of accusation in the reproof. And in fact, when the reproof comes not from a place of wanting to edify and grow the other individual and lift them up to, to a higher standard. But rather, the idea is either to lift oneself up and to say, like, look at me. Don't do things the way you do them. Rather, do things this way. Um, or 
when the idea is not motivated by love. It's maybe potentially motivated just by a disgust of what you see happening. And then you're like, I'm, I'm going to go stop it. But you're not moved from a heart of love. You know, when, when Christ looks at us as Christians, he doesn't move. He's not prompted by disgust. He's not prompted by his disgust of sin to come and speak to us. But he's prompted first by love. Yes, it doesn't mean he's not disgusted by sin, but he's not moving from a place of disgust, which is why he's not disgusted with us, which is why he does not hate us. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And so uh, the whole idea, let me, let me give you a simple example. I used to be part of a church, not, not even 10 kilometers from here. And there, the Seventh-day Adventist church is in our region. The women don't, they don't preach. You never see a woman on the pulpit. They don't chorister. You never see a woman leading song service. And whenever the studies that were done, they constantly felt like it was, and it's touched on in, the, in some of the chapters, it constantly felt like men were trying to teach women how to be women. They were reading dress reform and things about cooking and, and, and all of these things. And, and the question becomes, uh, now I'm not reproving the, that church, I'm just saying that sometimes we think we are moving from the right position, but the question is, but who's being edified here? Because it seems like the preaching is, is one-sided. Those who are on, I guess, the leadership end are preaching to those who need to be, to be converted. And, you know, you know, the messages were kind of like, you know, women should not be working. They should be at home. You know, we need to reflect on the testimonies. Those women who are working need to think about this honestly. And it's like, wow. Okay, like, what is, what is happening here? So that's one, that's one context. I mean, I'm sure there's other examples where, you know, people will just, for example, Brother Sichaba, when he did the, the, the presentation, he says when he first arrived at church, he had these long dreadlocks and a woman, an elderly woman walked up to him and said, um, if you don't cut those, those, those dreads off, I can promise you you're going to hell. I'm, para I'm paraphrasing now. Now that's cutting and slashing. That is like... Maybe the, there may be an element of, of, of truth. Maybe she had read somewhere something about, about hair and locks. I don't know. But he was new in the church. He didn't have that truth. But the person who approached him was not interested in that fact. They just needed, it feels like they just needed to get it off their chest. They just saw something that they felt was unacceptable in the house of God. And, and they felt they just needed to address it. Okay. Let's just read and read the explanation here. She says you're on page 612, third paragraph. This is uh, Testaments, Volume 1, Chapter 107. From time to time, for the past 20 years, I have been shown that the Lord had qualified my husband for the work of faithfully dealing with the erring and had laid the burden upon him, and that if he should fail to do his duty in this respect, he would incur the displeasure of the Lord. I have never regarded his judgment infallible. Did you hear that? Sister White was handpicked by who? The pastor, the institution. God handpicked Mrs. E.G. White and through God does not leave his people without a representative Amen. that he has handpicked. Sister White happens to be such a person. She's passed to the grave now. Okay. So a work on record is for us and we can treat it as God's communication to us directly. You know, God doesn't communicate directly to us. We know that like he did with Moses. You know, that's the old dispensation where you visibly and audibly felt the presence of God and saw it and heard it. God doesn't come to us like this so we can see and hear him. He speaks through his messengers, you know, 
And if they pass to the grave, they leave their publications on record. And she's saying yeah, she's never regarded his judgment as infallible, meaning he could err uh, in his judgment in dealing with these people. He was bound to make mistakes. However, this is the point here. The, we, we, don't, we can't tell the distinction as to who qualified who to correct who here in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is the problem we have. We, we, if we don't follow God's order, how are we going to be having confidence that the rebuke or the cutting and slashing being dished out is of God? Because God is doing it through us. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we follow what he has said and understand the context of how to dish out because we must dish out correction. We Absolutely. can't have people walking in here naked. You can't come here to God and, and come and look sexy for him on Sabbath. Who are you coming here for with your tight skirt or your tight trousers? You know? <laughs> That's let the me, question. Let me, Rara, sir, why you are on it? Sorry, facilitator. This, and to answer, because I want to uh, clarify that, that question of, you know, defining, cutting, and slashing. When she says, just a paragraph ahead there, she says, when she says, uh, who, the, for those who are qualified here, yeah, the last sentence says, such have the burden, please catch it. They have the burden of the work. So that's the place from which the reproof is coming. I'm concerned that the name of God will be blasphemed amongst the Gentiles because of your action. And then I'm concerned about your salvation. So it's, the, such have the burden of the work and feel compelled by the spirit, of course, from a love of precious souls to deal faithfully. So you will, always, you will always, I think we are intelligent enough to know when we, we people are dealing, handling this thing in, in an unfaithful manner. We do know what we struggle with is the effect it has on, upon us immediately. So my pride, you know, Bravuyo saw something wrong I'm doing and comes to tell me. And I am supposed to live in the glory of the no sister Eleanor this way when I'm not. Mm. Right. So I'm concerned about now he's 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 infiltrating my pride. It's got nothing to do with the, the burden of God from my perspective, at least. I think we struggle with that feeling of, you know, when we are re reproof, how do we deal with it? But those who are qualified, what will not be cutting and slashing is when there is wrong and it, it is for saving the soul from a love of the soul. I need to see this soul in the kingdom. And this is destroying the, the name of God. I mean, the things we do we, that unbelievers will not pitch here because they can see that, uh, but we thought this, this is not supposed to be right. Why is it tolerated in this place where there is supposed to be truth? And we cannot allow that because it blasphemes the name of God and it stops the cause, the mission from advancing. Such have the quality. That wouldn't be cutting and slashing. Cutting and slashing would really be, if you don't remove that dreadlocks, you aren't making heaven. It isn't written in scripture like that. That if you, there isn't a verse to back that. Very short. Uh, I've learned in my experience. I've learned, yes, I've learned in my experience. It's not so much how the message is presented to me, or even it's not so much how do I react. I've learned like when I hear somebody told me about you this and say, A B C D. My first question I've learned is to ask: Is that true? Amen. For example, somebody told me, "Ah, you speak too much." Is that true? And then I realized, oh, actually, I speak too much. So you, we, we also need to pause, that. even if it is cutting and whatever. You need to take the time to examine yourself Amen. and see. Amen. Amen. It's found in Galatians six verses one. Brethren, if a man he were taken in a fall, he which a spiritual restore such a, such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself less. Thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word 
communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So who's the person that is spiritual here that we can send? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was very touched by uh, later on in the chapter where she says that she saw that her husband was actually being too exacting in his dealing with, with others. And it's so amazing how God dealt with him in that he saw his own errors, his own mistakes, and he started feeling so despondent, you know, but God allowed him to feel that way mm -hmm. so that he can see for himself how he makes others feel. And mm -hmm. I just want to read what she writes here. I saw that if God should, should be as exacting as we are, and should deal with us as we deal with one another, we might all be thrown into a state of hopeless despair. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right. Um, I think the, the last thing I wanted to read, Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So, correcting others within the church is a necessary thing and and as brother Russell said and many of the other speakers alluded to God uses those around us to 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 rebuke us or to correct us because it is not speaking one of the things when, when I was reading these testimonies I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've got like a difficult decision to make or you're struggling or you're just going through a tough time and you're like Lord I wish I could hear your voice. Like, which way should I go? And and these brethren had had. Well, they were so fortunate. They had Sister White who would be shown their case, and she would write them a letter and say, "I've I've seen, you know, I've been shown that in doing this and this you you err, and that you should rather be be doing this and that. How how lovely that would be." Okay, um, I really believe that uh, when it comes to correcting others, it's something that comes from the heart. Um, because should come from the heart. <laughs> All right, thank you for correcting. <laughs> All right, what I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying. That, All right, what I'm saying is, um, I think I said it in the um, Zoom meeting last last uh, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So um, there is my colleague, there's one of my colleagues um, back then in, in, in March, it was really pressed on my, in my heart that I should correct him um, when it comes to drinking, right? Back in March. So that time when I arrived at work, with the way that he loves drinking, I didn't know where to start. Like, I was hesitant. Like, with the way that he likes drinking, how am I going to say it? But because of how convicted I was, it was so heavy that going back home after work without telling him, it was it was like hard time for me. Mm -hmm. Like, it was really convicting, very obvious. Like, so I spoke to him, like, I... I'm feeling that this is what God is saying. I should tell you. Uh, I think you should quit drinking beer. Right? I, I spoke in, with him in a very nice you know, way. So now, this week, like last Sunday, he called me in the kitchen at work and he said, I want you to pray for me. And I said, what do you want me to pray for? And he said, I want to pray for everything, marriage, and also include the fact that this drinking thing and all that. Then we prayed about it. And during that week, he said, I no longer, he made a decision finally that he, he, he stopped drinking. And I like the fact that he mentioned, he reminded me that, do you remember that you're the one who faced 
said about you spoke about this back in March that uh, I should quit drinking so that things will be go in line with God's plan. So I think when it comes to correcting, it's not something that just you just wake up and then you you know all mm -hmm. of a sudden it's really something that is to be convicting in your heart. The Holy Spirit is to lead you. Amen. As we move along, I think I like the point that Brother Emmanuel makes. I think when when you are convicted to correct, make sure that whatever correction you give does not contradict the word of God. Because if it does, then it's it's not coming from God. God does not contradict himself. All right. And we move along. Also, when you sorry, when you have corrected, just don't add end at correcting try walk with the person you have literally put the truth in the person to say oh sister this is not it you can't be doing this the word of the lord is impressing upon me to say let's walk in this way it's not a one-time thing mm -hmm. because i haven't received the light that you have received you are there i'm somewhere here you come and slash me and you leave mm -hmm. then i'm gonna you mentioned earlier to say you also need to think of where the fall, where they're falling. Are, are they falling on the good soil that is going to take it and germinate it? Or now you're going to, the story, the, I, I love the children's story this morning. Then it's going to squash me like that paper and you're going to leave me there squashed without helping me to get up. Talk to me, this is wrong, fine. Then walk with me shared the light with me and then i will get to know indeed this is not right before the eyes of the lord because i will remain harder than you left me or because because i i would feel like who are you the pride that you were talking about who are you are you in charge what spirit are you talking about is it of god for real like why are you correcting me and especially tinama adventist as Adventists, we think we have or we know it all before we get to know it all. Maybe I just read one Ellen G. White Scott. And now when you come then and tell me, you, you leave me undone. So talk to me, walk with me, and help me to get up. And Amen. then Amen. the Lord will be That present. is absolutely true. Mm. That is why in the sanctuary process of the church, more important than the process of sanctuary is the is the is the walk to recovery. That is the whole point of that process. To say, my brother, you've erred on this point, but now we need to walk with you to then get you up to a place where you are walking on the Lord's standard. Yeah, that's very important. That's being said there. The point of the admonition is to retain the soul. Mm. And that is a science we do not understand. Mm -hmm. You know, inspiration calls it the science of soul saving. So the whole point of having truth is to save souls. And if you don't understand the science behind it, don't even study Scientology or become a scientist. You're just wasting your time, you know. But I just want to clarify something. The sister, uh, so, yeah. sister Portia, she's got a nice approach to this whole censuring procedure and forgiving procedure right and what she's saying is as god it carries a lot of weight mm -hmm. however we need to make this absolutely clear because we don't understand the judgment when i talk about the judgment the message given to us sin is recorded as it is thought and conceived and it is retained there's more than one book in heaven it's called books pluralized okay the whole point of us having the truth is to ensure that our names are retained in the book of life so that your sins can be removed okay however you're going to spend a thought whoever makes it <laughs> god forbid <laughs> let me just say the saints who get to heaven when jesus comes the second time by the way he's come more than twice so that second coming is not written in the Bible. He says he'll come again. He gives a whole lot of comings with a description. 
However, that thousand years, that millennium, you're going to open all the books and you're going to undertake an auditing exercise no man has seen or will ever understand. Mm -hmm. And that audit is going to have every conceivable sin written there. So sin is retained in those books. Just to make it absolutely clear, those that do not resurrect, you're going to read every sin that was ever conceived in any human mind, and you're going to follow the procedure and the transgression and the admonition that was rejected and, and, and. That is your work during that thousand years. You can see God's justice and you can understand why they were not resurrected with a just. So don't make a mistake into thinking, today we were discussing grace in the lesson study. Grace is not a license to sin more. huh? Mm -hmm. And the fact that God is long-suffering, we'll reiterate it again, doesn't mean I can sin some more. Mm -hmm. Because when you lose the opportunity to have your sin removed, that's it. It's fixed, you know? And um, the brother gave a very... Uh, Galatians 6 sums up everything here. So anybody that... Uh, we in trouble now, by the way. Us seated here and whoever's online. Because now... We've explored the truth given us. Mm -hmm. And when these things are going to start con uh, approaching us, we're going to have to apply the letter of the word. And that's not going to be easy. So add to this chapter that we didn't even brush. We didn't even get through the third paragraph. Mm -hmm. yet, you know, add to that Galatians 6. And from Galatians 6, you go on your E.G. White app. You put in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, which is really Sister White's commentary on Galatians 6. And you put all of that together and you give it to the elder and the pastor and the president of the northern of the world church. Ted Wilson, I believe it still is, right? They know these things. It's their responsibility as elders, your local elder here, your pastor, your Cape Conference, you know, Sid and the whole structure of the church. They must take all this information and they must start exercising it and mark our words, not mine, our words, the Lord's words. It is not that easy to carry out what we're reading here and what we're discussing here mm. and the admonition we're giving one another. Come back here next mm -hmm. Sabbath and see the weight hanging on Mr. Elder and Mr. Deacon that has to, he has to stop people coming through those gates. Huh? And what's that going to look like? You're not allowed to come here. Why? <laughs> You're dressed inappropriately. We're not here to see your cleavage. Mm. Give it to your husband when the door is locked and your children mustn't even see it. Now what happens when we go to work? You know, I worked in a head office with over 12,000 employees and 90% of them were sexy women. How do you think I must carry out my bread and butter exercise? Being a married man, having responsibility in God's church and having the burden to save souls and carry out admonition and correction. And they're all over your face. You don't know where to look. You know what I asked the Lord to do? To release me from that burden of working there. That means I walked out of my career. And I said, goodbye paycheck. Goodbye medical aid. Goodbye and, and, and. And here we sit. That's just one example of dealing with the world we live in. It's not an easy thing. Mm -mm. Amen. All right. As we close, because we've run out of time. I mean, there's so much depth that we haven't even touched the surface of um all right let me let me let me do let me do a whole summary exercise um one of the things that comes out of so chapter 107 is called danger and self-confidence and one of the things that comes out of there is also the issue of debate right where i know sometimes when i was a new convert i was very zealous for the truth and i would often end up in debates against guys who were still with their sunday churches um engaging them and trying to convince them show them the error of their ways but um it, it, it probably doesn't end there i think sometimes we do end up in other discussions that where self really starts to come through and it's 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 almost like how is god being exalted in this whole conversation how is god 
being exalted in this whole process. Um, and you really find that there's an element of, of trusting oneself. I think the other aspect is also, even when we carry out duties that the Lord has asked us to carry out, you know, do we take the necessary time to prepare? Or is it a case of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm well versed in this area. I don't mind 30 minutes, brush through everything, and I go and I present. And, and before we catch on, uh, we, we, one will actually realize that we're actually moving from a place of self-confidence, from a place of, of relying upon your existing knowledge or relying on the fact I've done it before, I can do it again. And it's very subconscious. You don't, it's very subtle, you don't pick it up. And it requires, um, it requires trusting in God and never moving without God and always, yeah. All right. Then chapter 108 is called Be Not Deceived. And I think the primary question I had in my mind as I was reading that chapter, um, as it talks about the, 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 the deceptions that Satan tries to employ, is why does Satan use deception? Um, one person once described deception as like sleep. Like when you go to bed, at, rather when you fall asleep, um, you don't remember the time that you fell asleep. You only remember the time that you wake up. And deception is the same. You don't realize when you fall into deception. You only realize when you're hit with the truth and realize what you've believed all along was a lie. And so Satan lulls minds and he introduces deception because he knows we won't, we won't be able to pick it up that we are deceived in our conduct or we are deceived in our beliefs. All right. Um, chapter 109. I'll allow one or two comments if there's a if there's a chapter that that specifically spoke to you as I'm as I'm trying to summarize and close. Um, chapter 109 spoke about the publishing, um, publishing personal testimonies. Um, and one of the things that struck me there uh, is when Sister White says, not one in 20 of those who have a good standing with Seventh-day Adventists is living out the self-sacrificing principles of the word of God. Yeah. Not one in 20. Yeah. I'm sorry to do this. There's something we're not, uh, this, not one in 20. How many Adventists, how many Adventists were there at that point in time in the 1860s? Was 1860 odd year? They were minuscule, man. Very and she smart. said, not one in 20. Now, with 25 or 28 million, I don't know what's the guesstimation. I call it guesstimation because even when they appoint auditors, they don't get it right. Because my name is on several different churches here in this country, by the way. And I'm one person. You know, let's multiply it by 28 million. That means we're going to get 100 million SDAs. <laughs> now, if she said not one in 20 for that, few Adventists. What's the ratio like these days? Let's work out the math real quick. Hmm? One in a hundred? How about one in 10,000 or one in a million? Oh. This is what we must think about. eh? She said not one in 20 and there were very few of them. So that's just something we had to, I, I, we couldn't pass that, that thought. No, it's incredible. No, absolutely. It's incredible. Um, I don't know what the statistics are, but I think if you if you think about everyone sort of like talks about it and alludes to it, but we don't ever engage on it. But pornography addiction, it's it's very probable that every one out of two men are probably struggling with that issue. And I'm I'm speaking now to the to the one in you know, one in a million. These are some of the subtle things that we are not aware that are happening within the church. I'm not even talking now on a, on a, on a broader, on a broader scale. I think there was a hand. Yeah. Uh, that, that calculation, uh, a friend of mine once told me that that's equivalent to only one out of a hundred is ready. Yeah. Yeah. So that means you're all going to hell. Why would you say that? <laughs> 
Why we seem to yes? Because it's not even a hundred of us in here. That is we're all going to hell. <laughs> Well, we're seated here. <laughs> for, for, for I think we're, we're all hoping that grace will act on our behalf, but I think the call to reality, that's the call to reality to say, you know, where does grace? Sure. You said even grace has a limit. Mm -hmm. It and does. To honestly reflect and say, is grace able to save me where I am? Am I allowing God's grace mm. to do its work? Amen. Or am I hindering it by my own action? I think it's the publishing, in that publishing of personal testimonies, the fact that, you know, when when it's a, re, a reproof or a rebu rebuke, we learned it is brother B. The full names are not disclosed. And there was all these personal testimonies that she used to give them in private. But it became it came to the point where the issues dealt with affected it was relevant were relevant to the greater church and she was guided to be publishing that which she had been given in private mm. so that is and 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 you say why why we are today you know um i i i i, I am saying this and i'm seeing it this is now doing work for pharaoh we were discussing it this afternoon God is not waiting for the Vatican and the powers that be to publish a Sunday law. The mechanisms and all of those things are in place. The reason why he is waiting to act is to produce, is because he doesn't quite have a people yet. Amen. And I think this is, this is why we're doing this. That's why we have this to, to say that, listen, good and regular standing in the books of the church is not what saves you. It is actually, you, we have to have a settled knowledge in, in the truth. We have to be striving that now that we know these things, as difficult as they may be, and we don't take it lightly. I personally am not. I'm, I have discovered a lot of my defects through this experience mm. that I'm saying, Lord, I am willing to be made willing to be made whole. And, and as we discuss, uh, brethren, we, we have to realize that that is why the Lord is reviving initiatives like this, that we go and make sure, whereas the statistics look quite, you know, alarming, it is not impossible if we submit. And, and let, let's be going through this thing knowing, Lord, correct me, correct me, correct me now that I'm away. Sister Eleanor, on that point, and coming back to his, I call it pornographication, statistic, I'll tell you, I'll give you a personal testimony. There's a very simple way to shut it down. You see these things here. When sin is easily accessible, the powers of darkness sit and watch and they coerce and push you. You know, and now they sit and watch. He's going to reach. He's going to reach. All Eve had to do was separate from her husband. That's it. Never mind getting to the tree. Isolated. God said... In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely. She did not die instantaneously. Let's not forget that. It took time for them to die almost a thousand years. And we don't know how much time it took from the time she separated from her husband until they were cast out. You know, the, 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 the age of this earth is disputed by archaeologists. We've got evolutionist thinking amongst us in our institutions, and I talk about our church institutions, and this is the point I was trying to make, Sister Eleanor. The publication is for the church, not for the public domain, you know? Um, and coming back to this whole exercise of forgiveness, God wants us to contain it here. He doesn't want it going out. But unfortunately, we live in a digitized age. There's cameras all over the place. And you just profess SDA and they see you walking into a pub, for example. Mm. Yeah, what is he doing there? Kerkbrur. You know? This is the thing you're going to... You know, this is what we're going to struggle with. So if we take this lessons to heart and we follow what God has said, something is bound to happen and that is you're going to get resistance from your own brethren here. Yeah. And be prepared. Be prepared. You try and exercise righteousness and just see how they come at you. You know, you, you will wake up controversy. 
You will wake up evil that we thought didn't exist the minute you stand upright. And that is why she was bold enough to say not one in 20. Our ratio is now not one in 100. However, let's just believe those ones exist. Amen. Because the psalmist says, righteousness establisheth a nation. So evidently we have nations on this earth, right? That means there's righteous people in and amongst them. Because you cannot have an established nation without a righteous singular person Amen. lurking there. So the one in hundred, those ones exist and we all have the opportunity to become ones. Amen. Amen. I'm going to make two more points and then we will, we will close. Uh, have I? <laughs> two more points. Okay, these are generally the last two points. Um, the one I wanted to make, which I thought was quite important, or which struck me, was in chapter 110, the Health Institute. Uh, she makes this point. She says, I was shown that there is no lack of means among Sabbath keeping Adventists. Sorry, brother. Can you read the paragraph or the page number? Um, oh, I didn't. I kept deleting the references. Okay. It's, yeah. It says, yeah, I was shown that there is no lack of means among Sabbath keeping Adventists. At present, their greatest danger is in their accumulations of property. Some are continually increasing their cares and labors. They are overcharged. The result is God and the wants of his cause are nearly forgotten by them. They are spiritually dead. They are required to make a sacrifice to God in offering. A sacrifice does not increase, but decreases and consumes. And then she talks about the fact that there was, when she makes this point, there had been a call um, for the Adventists to invest. This was, this was the call to invest in the Health Institute. And I, I think it was the one at Battle Creek, the sanitarium at Battle Creek. And the call was to invest and she wasn't, and so she, she, she calls out this idea of investing because investing comes with returns. Yeah. And, and she, that's when she says she was shown that there's no, there's no lack of means. Uh, but what ended up happening is now everyone was, not, not everyone, but what she was rebuking was this idea that people were being motivated to give, there was a profit motive because they were now going to get something in return. And what ended up happening is one brother had just a hundred dollars and he gave, he invested that hundred dollars in the Institute. But then he, his, I think it was his wife who got sick and he ended up not having enough money to take his wife to that very same institution that he was invested in. And so this is when she says that if we had all been giving freely, there would have been opportunity for the poor to benefit from our institutions. I think in one of the discussions that was had, there was a comment that was made about the cost of Adventist schooling. In some cases, Adventist education can be quite expensive. Um, and that's because there's a want of means because oh, she, also, she also talks about administration, by the way. She also addresses the issue of administration. So there could be various things contributing to this, but one of them is that as Adventists, we don't support our institutions. So I thought it was important for us to just be reminded that, um, I mean, if you look at, Take any of the schools around here, Weinberg Girls or Rustenberg Girls. They have old girls and old boys groups who give money in hordes. And that's why they're able to maintain the standard that we are now chasing. And yet, if we did the same for our own Adventist institutions, you know, they could be at the standard that God requires. Not, and that's the other thing. It's not that we should be trying to get them to a worldly standard. God has his own standard that he wants these institutions to be at. And if we, if we, would, if we would just give. Um, then the last point I wanted to make is seen in chapter... I just want to see... Yes, chapter 114, the case of Hannah Moore. The case of Hannah Moore. Wow. Wow, that, 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 that chapter touched my heart as I, as I read, and I was like, wow. And I think, strangely enough, so let me just lay the context. 
So Hannah Moore was a new believer in Christ and she had been in the Sunday churches and she was converted and she was quite advanced in years. Um, and her health wasn't in the best condition either. And so she moved by God's spirit and her conviction. She wanted to live and work among Adventists. And she picked the, the community of Battle Creek in particular. And she was looking for an opportunity to, to be hired by one of the believers there. Uh, a lot of them had the means. Sister White actually says that they, you know, there was no wanting means for them to be able to employ her. She could have taught their children. She could have helped around the home. And so she ends up being admitted at, um, at the sanitarium in, in Battle Creek, and she spends about a week there. But in that time, there was literally no, no support for her, a new convert, such that she had then to go back home. And, uh, or, or Lilano, I'm not sure if Lilano was her home or not, but she ends up going back to. Okay. And she had been engaging with brother and sister White, who had not the means. I mean, we read earlier that they didn't have the means. And they kept trying to get people in Battle Creek to engage with her. And I think it was a period of about two years. And, and it, it never happened. And anyway, the point is that, and it's interesting, at Claremont in particular, I mean, even at the church I was at previously, you had like one or two people who were homeless. But at Claremont, we, I think, over time, at some point, we've had maybe three. And, you know, I'm guilty as well. You know, they come to our church, like, what are we able to do for them? You know, it's, it's tough. Like, I think we need to come together. We need to make a plan. Can we get them admitted at, at, at Sunnyside or some other home or some other effort? You know, I know there's efforts that have been done on the two cases, I won't reveal any names, where, um, you know, people have been assisted to get into a home for the elderly or whatever, where they need to get assistance, but not in all cases. Um, and I think it was just such a, a rebuke to the church at Battle Creek. And she ends up, she ends up dying. Um, she falls ill and she, she dies in isolation. I mean, she, she knew that her time was coming to an end in some of the letters that she was writing to Sister Ellen. Um, and she even says to her, I can't even say to you, come and see me because I imagine by the time you get here, you know, I may be no more. It was such, such a, such a, such a sad story. But I think the biggest rebuke is that, you know, she had been amongst Adventists and no one could even take the time to attend to her case, even though they had the means. Um, yeah, I think that was very, everybody, if you read that, yeah, you probably wept in your, in your reading because it's a new convert. It's the nurturing that you want to retain this person within the community. And at one stage, Mrs. White and elders, Mrs. White, even though they didn't have the means, they, they asked the brethren, they, were, they had to be in mission. And they asked the brethren, please take care of her while we are away. When we come back, we will take her into our house. And in the course of that period, she ended up eventually dying with these beautiful letters that she left behind. And you're just, you know, highlighting this and you think we're not really paying attention to people as we fellowship every Sabbath to Sabbath. It's because of this, actually, I'm also very guilty. Today I started realizing anybody that just stands looking lost, I have to go and approach them. And I'll tell you, I found, I made some friends today. Some, it's, it's a blessing. Like people just stand and we are very used to our cliques, right? I know this one. I know this one. I know this one. And I had to tell the one, and he's been worshiping here. I had to go and tell him, I, I need to confess because I just see you and I just pass. But today I want to, I see you now. I think I have the opportunity to properly greet you and engage with you. And we start there and there is the, the you know, the introduction. Church has become a social and it's in and out. 
And what I'm learning from this in the way that our pioneers labor to give us this framework is really a stern rebuke. And it's really high time we woke up and realized, again, the Lord is reviving these initiatives to prepare a people. We are the ones making the Lord not come mm -hmm. because then he doesn't have a people. I mean, look at how far we are. When you read this thing, you realize how far you are from the mark. So quite, he can't come. He really can't come. He doesn't have a people. So my, my hope and my prayer is just, again, I mean, maybe repeating myself, let's be walking this walk and realizing, Lord, I'm willing because the cases are in front of us. You don't, how could she really, how do you feel? And I don't know how the Lord judges the brethren, but this sister ended up dying when you could do something for her. Amen. Amen. All right. Brother Antonio, and then, okay, there's another hand, and then I'll do a closing, closing prayer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that is such a, a touching story and rebuking, especially to us, you know, as the people of the word. And we have those situations that we, yeah, that we can simulate you know, mm -hmm. this very issue where there are people that are suffering in our church that don't get attended to because we we have those clicks, you know, like she's saying. And it's so sad because what spirit is leading us mm -hmm. when we come here, you know, I think we need to ask ourselves personally when we come here, why are we coming here? Mm -hmm. And also the fact that we we have carried this truth for a long time. And I don't think God will wait to come when there are other people who are willing to be used out there. And that's why he says in his word, I have people, I have my people out there that will gather on one mountain eventually. We don't know when, but it will happen. So I think we need to wake up. Amen. 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 The key is what I mentioned earlier about the Bible when it says these things were written for our admonition mm. to whom the ends of the world are come so that we can learn and avoid repeating the same mistake. So that's why these studies here are not in vain. And I encourage each one of us, wherever you go, I do it myself. Every time I've given an opportunity to preach, like last week, before I start my sermon, the first thing is to mention this group because we want to get as many people as we can and as many churches to create their own programs such as mm -hmm. this, because more than never before, we need to study this. Question, I, I was wondering all the time, why was that place named with such a name? Battle Creek, what's the meaning? No. Battle Creek. The creek <laughs> yeah, what's the meaning of that? I've been wondering. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Homework. Homework, yeah. <laughs> Homework. Maybe maybe it's in, in sketches. Yes. Yes. Some names are prophetic because there was a lot of battles in Battle Creek. <laughs> <laughs> My point. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I think my I'll have to end here. I know there's a closing prayer, maybe closing remarks to, to tell us what the next step will be. But I would encourage you um, 
you know, there's other chapters we didn't touch on. The Christian's watchword, sympathy at home, another beautiful chapter, yes. particularly for those of us who are married. Um, the husband's position, there were some key discussions. Um, <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, the husband's position, the world that we live in has 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 this thing of inverting our our God-given roles and responsibilities. You, like I was saying earlier, you, you now have men preaching about what it means to be a woman and women talking about what it means to be a man. And it's 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 so there's so much confusion in the world and, and these testimonies are assisting us to to correct those 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 misconceptions about what it is God requires. Let me okay. thank you so much. I was guided last time, rebuked. I wouldn't keep you long. It's we're not going to weigh out the saints. And this is what I like, folks. We need to be sincere with each other. Amen. You need to tell me when I'm wrong. It's the only way I, I can do right. Because sometimes I don't see my wrong. The one other chapter, a girl, a mother, you have to reread it. It's the cookery stuff. <laughs> it is a religious duty. Oh, you're lifting your, I see you lift your forehead. Yeah. If you saw, that was the quote on our flyer. It is a religious duty for those who cook to, uh, to learn how to prepare healthy food um, in different ways so that it may be eaten with enjoyment because you are what you eat. And it doesn't mean that because now you've become plant-based, just put some lettuce, nothing looks interesting at all for what appetizing or appealing. No ways. And I like the fact that, you know, some of us would have the privilege of having helpers who work in the home while you have children. And the tendency is to think that that person does the whole thing while your children have a life. You're not doing your children a favor. You must know, we must train our children, quick one. My boy just, when he just turned 12, I had gone out <laughs> with my daughter and we left him at home. Eh -eh. I'm coming back and finding the whole kitchen is full of all this flour. Yeah, my kitchen is in the mess. I was going to be like, what? I just realized he's going to YouTube. He wanted to make a certain um, roti. He's gone and gotten the recipe for roti making. And oh, you know, the, the, the exactly. He, he's seen his sister do, do it. Hey, I come back to my kitchen, the flower is all over the place. He, yeah, they, he's yeah. gone and rolled the thing. So he's, because now we are out, then he's, he's researched it. Now I come and I see the recipe is dead. Then he's quickly hoping he'll quickly do it before we come, he's done. Hey, come and find my kitchen is in a state. And then I realized I should rebuke him. And then I thought, hey, what am I doing here? You know, so he enjoys the fact that you don't, I, in my house, you have to do, it's a have to do, everybody, we help each other. So he, now they have even split the duty between themselves. His sister makes him, so after sunset on Sunday morning, he goes to dry, remove the, uh, uh, put the dishes into the washing, you know, make sure that kitchen is clear. So you go and clear the rack and clear this and clear that. And when I read this, I'm not trying to tell you I am there. I'm, it's not yet there, but I thought, hey, at least some things we are doing right, right? We shouldn't, we, you're doing your children a favor when you teach them all those things. It is such a favor, but I love that chapter. Everybody should read it. And like I said, I was rebuked and I take it very nicely. I wouldn't keep you too long. But folks, this, thank you very much, Brother Vuyo. Um, at the cover, we covered across. You may not have seen it, but what we discussed from the beginning, the other rebukes to the individuals, brother B and all of that, we 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 largely covered it. Um, this this is just a this is just a blessing. We are we have finalized.
Oh. Forgive me. Excuse my emotion. And I'm just ashamed that I am only knowing these things only now. <sighs> the next time we meet, that will be the 19th of August. We will be starting volume two. And uh, we'll have an intro to that. And Brother Rudy Damas will be the presenter. I just pray that we will continue. See, folks, don't, don't be scared. If you, I say if you haven't read, keep the pace with the group, but go back in your private and read. You will know why, why I'm encouraging you. This has got nothing to do with, with who is responsible for the department. But I'm telling you, I understand why now the devil hates the voice of prophecy in our church. You cannot come out of this and remain the same. You cannot. So let's be our brother's keeper. Not because we want to prove righteous than thou, but because we want to be neighbors in heaven. My greatest wish is to see the face of God. If I miss seeing the face of God, that's my biggest fear. So I take courage in this. Because I'm beginning, I told the Lord, I now realize you're trying to get me ready to see your face. I've got to see Jesus' face. I don't know about you, what you're looking for. I need to see his face. And this is why the testimonies were given. Read your things that you want to read, but please read the testimonies in your spare time. So I praise the Lord for the participation. I praise our online participants. Thank you for holding the line that side. Thank you for holding the line here. Stay focused. And that means keep the main things, the main things. Amen. Stay focused. May God bless our homes. I'm going to ask Sister Shereen this time. Oh, my brother, you do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please come up. Come and do that. You did the opening prayer that time. Today you're doing the closing prayer. <laughs> and, and pray that the Lord will launch us into volume two grand style. Amen. Um I just want to say that uh, growing up in this church, I, I I was born in this church and um this church is really a huge institution. It's teaching you, you know, um, is there any pastors here? No. It just show to me that this church can teach. And you be, this, this, day, this place today is a seminary. I've learned myself so much. I can't stop learning. And I also want more and more of this beautiful truth. I want to say thank you for God for working in our sister's heart to, to implement the studies. And just to sit and listen from all of you talking is such a learning for me myself. So learning in this place is never ending. We praise God for his goodness and mercy for all of us. It, um, it's just that, uh, sister, I'm also very busy uh, going out on Sabbath. And uh, I so wish to be here at times when you are here. So if I'm here, then you know I'm off. <laughs> but God is good. I learned so much from you. So we together. Our Father in heaven, really, Lord, we, we, we say your presence. We, we feel you, Lord. And Father, um, I am touched. Lord, through this uh, readings of Ellen G. White. And Lord, she has gone through many trials and tribulations. And Father, according to Paul, according to Romans 8, verses 18, for I reckon the suffering of this present time does not compare to the glory we will be revealed in us. Father in heaven, let us not complain of what is going on now or the suffering we are going through right now. Help us, Father, to love right with one another. Lord, let us do our art, Father, to do what we can to really to 
soon Jesus, Father, may we be ready when he comes. And Father, that number which my brother mentioned about the one, one out of a hundred, Lord, I feel very scared about that. Oh, please, Lord, let all of us be in that number. Father, bless every household that is represented here today and take us through this week. We need you so much, Father. Our children, our grandchildren, wherever they are. And some of our members, of our family members are not in this faith. But we hope, Father, and trust that we will also be gathering in into this beautiful truth of Jesus Christ. Father, bless us now as we go home. Please don't depart from us, Lord, although we, we depart from each other. Lord, take us through this week, and thank you for your goodness and mercy. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us the as we forgive our trespasses which are against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thine way and the glory, ever and ever. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you so very much. I want to give a big amen. Can we shout a big amen to our technical team? Thank you. Thank you, children. Thank you very much. God be with you. Guard the edges of the Sabbath. Thank you, my brother.